Justine Waters picked up the phone when she heard it buzz. It was a message from her husband Tom, who had been out of town on business for the past few days. She unlocked her phone and read the message. Business is over here, the message read. I'm on my way back now. Dinner reservations are for 7 o'clock tonight at Mario's. I'll see you there. Happy anniversary. There were no lovey-dovey tenderness or heartfelt emoticons. That didn't really surprise her. For some reason, Tom hadn't been very social lately. See you around, Justine wrote back. Happy anniversary, love you. She sent the message and put her phone on the nightstand, hoping to see a response, at least something. Everything would be okay. But there was no reply. Justine looked at her watch and realized she had just enough time to clean herself up before meeting her husband. She sighed, got out of bed and headed to the bathroom to shower before meeting her husband. Who was that? Jake Carter, the man she had just spent hours with, asked. My husband, Justine said. He let me know he was coming back. He's already made reservations for us at Mario's for tonight. It's our fifth anniversary. Your fifth anniversary, huh? Jake asked. I thought you said he went back east. Yeah, he was there, Justine said. Apparently he managed to finish everything early. I need to call my mom, see if she'd mind watching little Jacob for a little while longer. Okay. Then go back to bed, Jake said with a sly grin. Maybe we can give Tom a little present, Justine snorted at that. I'd love to Jake, but I really need to clean up a bit, and I don't have a lot of time, she said. Luckily, I have some clean clothes here that I can wear. You shouldn't go out with your husband in the clothes I was wearing here. It's crumpled and stained. Do you think he knows about us? Justine shook her head. No, I don't think so. He's been very busy with something lately. It's been occupying almost all of his attention. He rarely talks to me and almost never does anything with the baby. It's like he's in a whole other world. How long are you going to keep him around? Jake asked. Justine shrugged. It's hard to say. He's a good provider. I know he'd be a great father if he wanted to be. Do you think he knows that little Jacob isn't his? If he does, he's not saying anything. I can't imagine he'd let something like that happen without mentioning it to me. Well. I'll be around if you need anything. Justine smiled at him, glancing down at his flaccid penis that was now resting on his right leg. Just warm it up for me, okay, she said with a sly smile. You got it, baby, he told her, returning the smile. Justine walked over to her closet and pulled out a clean dress. She couldn't believe how much of her closet was in this closet instead of the closet she shared with her husband. Justine looked at the dress she had chosen, trying to remember if Tom had seen it before. It was blue fell to about three inches above the knee, and revealed a rather deep, seductive neckline. She was pretty sure Tom had seen it before. If not, she'd just tell him she'd just bought it. After calling her mother, Justine went into the bathroom and took a nice hot shower. After her shower, Justine brushed her long, dark hair until it was just right, got dressed and applied her makeup. Satisfied that she looked and smelled good enough to pass Tom's inspection, she kissed Jake and said goodnight. I'll see you at the office tomorrow, he asked looking her over from head to toe. Of course, my love, but duty calls today. She picked up her purse and walked leisurely out of the room. Tom Waters took a drag on his cigarette as he sat in his Escalade in the parking lot across from Mario's. He had just received a message from one of the private investigators working for him that Justine had left the luxury condominium owned by Jake Carter, her lover for the past almost a year and a half. He looked at the picture of her in the past almost a year and a half. He looked at the picture of her in the blue dress sent by the private investigator. It wasn't the dress she'd come to Carter's apartment in, and of course Tom hadn't seen it before. He wasn't surprised. Justine was right about one thing. Tom had been out east, but had returned a day early. He had been told unequivocally that he had a serious security breach that needed to be addressed immediately. He was told that if he didn't deal with it, they would. They? of course, were a federal agency that the public wasn't even allowed to know existed. Tom remembered how nervous he had been sitting in the office of the one-eyed man he knew only as Alpha One. Only a handful of people were allowed to know the man's name, and Tom wasn't on that list. You have a serious problem, Waters, the man said, moving his head in a way that reminded Tom of the actor who had once played Moses. And when you have a problem, all of us have a problem. Solve that problem, quiet or I will. Yes, sir. Tom said. He was smart enough to know that was the only answer Alpha One would accept. And he also knew that Alpha One had no qualms about making people disappear. He had heard stories of how Alpha Odin had once destroyed an entire beach estate along with everyone inside. Tom shuddered at the thought. Justine had thought Tom was just a well-known salesman who traveled the country selling his merchandise to various companies looking to upgrade their security systems. But Tom was much more than that. Sure, 
He did sell security equipment and oversee the installation, but he was more than just a salesman, much more than that. The equipment he sold and installed had special circuits that gave the Alpha One monitors an idea of almost everything these companies did, who they took on as customers, what they did with their profits, everything. And Tom knew that the problem Alpha was talking about was his wife of five years, Justine. Well, that is, five years until today. For about the last year and a half, she'd been having a torrid affair with Jay Carter, one of the senior partners at the law firm where she worked as a paralegal. Tom hadn't known all the details until recently, primarily because he spent a lot of time traveling for work, but he had noticed that something had been off between them for a while. By the time he learned the details of the affair, Justine had announced she was pregnant. The lawyer Tom spoke to told him that no judge in this state would even consider a divorce while Justine was pregnant. If the baby turned out to be his, he would be on the hook for child support, regardless of the prenuptial agreement they both signed. Unless he didn't have to worry about the house he already owned before the marriage. Tom gritted his teeth and remained silent throughout the pregnancy, and nearly lost his temper when she named the boy Jacob in honor of his sperm donor. Immediately after the boy's birth, Tom had a DNA test done. He wasn't surprised to learn that the boy wasn't his. Glancing at his watch, Tom realized Justin would be here soon. He saw a man in a khaki jacket standing at the door of Mario's with a woman with a briefcase in her hands, and knew it was for him. He drove across the street and parked. Grabbing his ubiquitous briefcase, he headed for the front door, nodding slightly to the two people at the door. Tom spoke quietly to the woman at the door and was soon seated in a corner booth. A khaki-clad man and woman sat in another booth within earshot. Tom thanked the waitress for the water and began looking over the menu. He noticed Justine's presence at the table and set the menu aside. He stood up as she slid into the booth across from him. Good evening, Justine, he said in a neutral tone. You're looking very well this evening. Thank you, Tom, she said, smiling. I don't recall seeing that dress before. Is it something new? Yeah, I just bought it. Do you like it? Yeah, it really sets off your eyes, he told her with a slight smile. After they finished their order, they heard music playing from another part of the place. Mario's was more than just a restaurant. It also had a dance floor and a cocktail bar. It sounds like they're playing our song, Justine said. Tom knew that was her way of saying she wanted to dance. What the hell, he thought. It was their anniversary, even if it was going to be their last. Would you like to dance, he asked, standing up. I don't mind, Justine said, holding out her hand. Tom took her hand and led her to the dance floor. They danced in each other's arms, but Justine couldn't help but notice that Tom kept some distance between them, like he could barely touch her. The song finally ended, and Tom escorted her back to the booth. By then, their food had been brought to them and they began to eat. Is something wrong, Tom? Justine asked. You seem so reserved. It's our anniversary. Yes, it is, said Tom. The thing is, your dress smells like it's been hanging in Jake Carter's closet for a long time. And no matter how hard you try, you haven't been able to completely cleanse your body of his stench. What? Justine asked, offended that Tom was talking to her like that. Jake Carter, are you serious? She asked, trying unsuccessfully to distract Tom. Yes, you know Jay Carter, one of the senior partners at the law firm you work at, Tom said as if nothing had happened. Of course I know him, Justine said sarcastically. I certainly hope so, Tom said. After all, you've spent enough time in his bed, plus he's little Jacob's sperm donor. What are you saying? This is outrageous. I'm not going to sit here and listen to you talk to me like that, she said indignantly. Actually, sit. Tom said, opening his briefcase. You're going to sit there and absorb whatever information I decide to give you, especially after what you've been doing for the last 16 months. What? I don't know what you're talking about. Sure you do. Let's start with this, he added, dropping a piece of paper in front of her. What's this? It's the result of your baby's DNA test. According to this, Jacob is not my son. The next sheet is another DNA test that proves that the sperm donor is none other than your lover, Jake Carter the man you named Jacob after. How could you have gotten Jake's DNA? She asked in confusion. It was easy. You brought it home with you at least three nights a week, but that wasn't all. He pulled out a thick folder and tossed it on the table. What was it? A copy of every email, text message, and email between you and Jake for the last 16 months. I hate to break it to you, but there's really no such thing as internet privacy at all. Okay, I admit it, she said. Jake and I fooled around once, but that was it and it was just sex. It didn't mean anything, not at all. Really? Please turn to page 75 and go about halfway down the page until you find the passage I've highlighted. Tell me what you see. 
She flipped through the pages until she got to the one Tom was referring to. Her face paled as she read her own words to Jake. I'm waiting, I'm reading it, she said quietly, out loud. I want to hear you say the words you wrote to him. She swallowed and looked at the page again. Please, she begged, don't make me do this. Either you do it or I will, and if I do it, I don't care who hears it. Tears streaming down her face, Justine looked at the paper again and began to read the words Tom had highlighted. I love what you're doing to me, Jake. I have never felt as wonderfully fulfilled as I have in the last 16 months. I can't wait for you to knock me up with another baby. In all the time we've been married, I don't remember you ever talking to me like that, Tom said. Is that all you have? She asked nervously. No, I have pictures, audio, and video, hours upon hours of video. You must really hate me, Justine said quietly. Yes, of course I do. She looked up, shocked by what he had just said. It was like a slap in the face. There was a time when I would have taken a bullet for you. How long have you known? I had my suspicions even before you told me you were pregnant. I did some digging and got some evidence, enough to satisfy the prenup. However, by the time I spoke to a lawyer, you had informed me that you were pregnant. The lawyer explicitly told me that no judge would even consider divorce until after you had given birth, child support and all that. But now that Jacob was born, I had more than enough evidence to do my job. So I filed for divorce on grounds of adultery. Tom pointed to two people at a neighboring table who stood up and walked over to their table. This nice man has something for you. Miss Justine Waters, the man asked. Yes, Justine said quietly. The man placed a heavy paper envelope in front of her. You have been served. Served? Justine asked, tears rolling down her face. Yes, Tom said, handing her a pen. Divorce papers, look at them. They're exactly as we agreed in the prenup. Sign them now and I'm ready to give you a bank check for $2, 145. 63, the exact amount you had when we got married. Don't ask for anything else. I already know about your secret little slush fund. You can keep it. All your things were delivered to your mother's house. Yes, she knows and she's very disappointed in you. But she's agreed to let you stay with her until you find a place of your own. For the boy, not for you. But I don't want a divorce, Justine said. Yeah, love you. Please. Justine, don't insult my intelligence. Listen to this. He pulled out his phone and replayed her conversation with Jake from earlier that day. Her eyes widened when she heard her own voice coming from Tom's phone. How, how, how did you get that? She asked. Well, I tell you, but then I'd really have to shoot you on sight. As much as I hate you right now, I really don't think it was right to deprive little Jacob of his mother. Tom said with a smile that lacked warmth. I was nothing more than food stamps and a guardian to you while your baby daddy got all the benefits. Just so you know, your ticket is punched. No more free lunches for you, at least not from me. What about Jake? She asked. Worried about daddy, huh? Luckily, we live in a state that allows lawsuits for alienation of affection. He's being served right now. It may or may not lead to something, but it's the principle that matters, isn't it? Either way, his problems are just beginning. You see. Today I spoke to Hamilton Parker, your managing partner, showed him my evidence and expressed my displeasure, knowing that one of his senior partners was involved with a subordinate, specifically a subordinate who is my wife, at least for the time being. Mr. Parker was quite upset and more than a little concerned that Mr. Carter's antics might draw unwanted attention to his firm, not to mention a rather significant financial burden. He agreed that it would be best if Mr. Carter was no longer associated with the firm and assured me that he would discuss this with his board of directors this evening. He also agreed that it would be wrong to penalize you, especially since you are a mother with a newborn baby. After all, Mr. Carter was your boss, if I may say so, and he didn't want to expose the firm to a potential sexual harassment suit. Given your work history there, he agreed it would be best to keep you on board, at least for a while. But I assure you. Mr. Carter's problems are just beginning, Tom said. How much do you know about your lover? I mean, really know? What are you talking about? Justine asked. I'm talking about his clients, the people he does business with. I mean, who he really represents, and what he does when he's not stuffing you into his mattress. What do you know about that? I don't know, he doesn't talk to me about any of that stuff. That's probably a good thing. Let's just say your Jake Carter has a very interesting clientele. The kind that attracts the attention of certain federal agencies, agencies that can make a man disappear without a trace. You know what I'm talking about? You scare me, Tom, and you should be scared, he told her. Are you scared enough to stay away from Jake Carter? Because he's going down, and if you're anywhere near him when it happens, you're going down too. Who are you, 
Tom? She asked, really? He smiled, nodding his head at the papers in front of her. Sign the papers, Justine, and stop this farce now. I've probably told you too much already. And by the way, your credit card has been cancelled, and your house key doesn't work anymore. I changed the locks today while you were with Jake. I also took care of the bank account so you no longer have access to it. Considering you save half your earnings into your own secret account, that shouldn't be a problem for you anyway. You knew everything, didn't you? She asked. Tom shrugged his shoulders. Defeated, Justine looked over the divorce papers and saw that they were exactly as Tom had said. She signed the papers and handed the pen back to Tom. He smiled, took the pen and looked over the papers. The process server witnessed the signatures and the woman accompanying him notarized the signed documents. Tom handed the papers back to the man. I'll make sure this gets to your lawyer, Mr. Waters, the man said. Thank you, Tom said. After they left, Tom turned to Justine again. I think you should give your rings back, he told her. Do I have to do that? I love those rings, she exclaimed. Apparently not enough to stay out of Jake Carter's bed. Justine tearfully removed the rings and placed them on the table. He put them in his pocket before turning to her. I believe our business here is concluded. Is that your conclusion? Is that all you have to say? What more needs to be said? Tom asked, Why? Why did you do this on our anniversary? She asked, tears streaming down her face. Do you know how humiliating that was for me? Do you know how humiliating it was for me to find out that you've been fooling around with me all this time? And how humiliating it was to find out that Jacob wasn't my son. And how humiliating it was for me to find out you fucked Carter on our anniversary. Don't give me that, Tom said, we're done, we're done. Goodbye, Justin, I never want to see your face again. With these words, he went back to his food without looking at Justine, who was wiping her face. We're done, goodbye, Justin, I never want to see your face again. With these words, he went back to his food without looking at Justine, who was wiping her face. The waitress came over and asked if everything was okay. Yes, the food is excellent as always, Tom said nonchalantly. I'll take care of the payment, and I suppose the lady will take her food with her, please. Yes, sir, the waitress said as she left to get Justine's food box. She returned a few minutes later and put Justine's leftover food in a styrofoam container. Tom handed the waitress his credit card and paid for the food while Justine gathered her things. When the waitress was done, Justine looked at Tom. That's it? That's it, Tom said, waving his hand. She couldn't believe he had just brushed her off. I'm sorry, Tom. He tore his gaze away from his food before he spoke. Well, we can both agree on that, he said. Now have a good day. Say hi to your mom for me. And happy anniversary, he added with a slight smile. Justine, not believing the calm manner in which her husband had basically just tossed her out like trash, ran out from the table, sobbing. Tom smiled and went back to eating. He noticed several diners looking at him with disdain, but only smiled back, shrugging his shoulders. Outwardly, he may have been calm and collected, but inside he was emotionally shattered. Five years down the drain, at least now the worst was over. Epilogue. Tom managed to get through the next few days without incident. It hadn't been easy. He had once really loved Justine, and it hurt him that he had to treat her like that, but he decided it was better to do that than to pounce on her the way he wanted to. Then the day came when he heard a knock on his front door. He was in his master bedroom upstairs and looked out the window to see Carter's sports car in the driveway. He had a hunch that something like this was going to happen, so he made some additions. To his home security system at Alpha One's urging. He went downstairs and opened the door. It was Jake Carter, of course, and he was angry. Tom backed up as Carter squeezed his way in. You son of a bitch, you cost me my job, and Justin won't even talk to me. I'll kill you, you fucking piece of shit. Jake shouted, blushing. He loomed over Tom until he saw 15 tiny red dots suddenly appear on his shirt. Emergency, Storm, an electronic voice shouted from speakers built into the walls, don't move. What the hell is this, shouted the uninvited guest. He raised his hands as if swiping the dots. Suddenly there was the jerky sound of a gunshot, like the blast from an air rifle. When Jake looked down, he saw 15 darts sticking out of his body. He reached up, but he never did. His eyes rolled up and his body collapsed to the floor. I don't think you're going to be able to kill anyone today, Carter, Tom said calmly, grabbing his phone. He pressed an icon on the phone and heard a man's voice. Operator 715463, clean up aisle 15, Tom said. Clean up aisle 15, copy that, the man said. Tom pressed another icon, and the systems that had just fired a charge of tranquilizer darts at Jake turned and retracted back into the ceiling. When the doors of the systems closed, 
No one could tell there was anything there. Tom smiled, satisfied that the new security system had worked as announced. A few minutes later, an unmarked white van pulled into the driveway. Several men in Tyvek suits entered the house and dragged Jake's gutless body out. One of them grabbed Jake's keys and got into the sports car. A couple minutes later, the van and Jake's sports car were gone. Tom closed the door and went about his business. A few days later, after Tom had bought a caramel mocha at a local coffee shop, he was stopped on the street by a large man in a dark suit and sunglasses. Alpha One wants to talk to you, Mr. Waters. The man growled. Now. Okay, Tom said, a little discouraged by the man's behavior. He followed the man to a long black limousine parked on the side of the street and got in after the man opened the back door. Waters, good to see you're out, Alpha One said after the door closed. Yes, sir, I have a lot to do, Tom said. Alpha Odin smiled and put his hand on Tom's shoulder in a friendly manner. You're welcome, Tom. When it's just the two of us, you can call me Regis, said the one-eyed man. I wanted to give you an update on Mr. Carter. He sings like a canary. Thank you, Alpha, Regis. So he says all the right things then, Tom asked. Yes, he does it right off the bat, said Regis. But now he's literally singing like a canary. Seems the combination of those tranquilizer darts and the new security system and the serum we use to extract the information we need has turned his brain into applesauce. Right now he's swinging on a swing in a metal cage and chirping like a bird. Tom said, Regis pulled an envelope out of his jacket pocket and held it out to Tom. We got him to settle out of court with you before he got too incompetent to sign his name, Regis said. He was so grateful to be alive that he agreed to a lot more than you wanted. Well, that's good to hear said Tom. By the way, I want you to know that I'm really impressed with your new system, Regis said. Now that we got what we need from Carter, I'm glad you didn't use the 50 caliber chain guns I suggested. Me too, Tom said. I had my carpet cleaned recently. Regis grinned at that. Have you heard anything about Justine? Tom asked. Yes, she's back to work, although Mr. Parker keeps her on a very short leash. Did you ever mention to her who you really work for? Regis asked. No. Regis, I never did, said Tom. Regis nodded his head. He already knew that from his monitoring devices, but he wanted to hear it from Tom in person. Okay, Regis said, well, when your divorce is finalized, I'd like you to come to headquarters. I'd like to introduce you to your new partner. Partner, Tom asked, I've never needed a partner before. Well, there's a first time for everything, isn't there, Tom? Yes, sir, I suppose so, said Tom. Good, said Regis. Then I look forward to meeting you. Me too, Regis, said Tom. The door opened, signaling the end of the meeting. Tom stepped out of the limousine and watched as the large man squeezed into the driver's seat. As the long car emerged into the traffic, Tom wondered what Regis had in store for him. As the large man squeezed into the driver's seat. As the long car emerged into the traffic, Tom wondered what Regis had in store for him. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.